recording. Okay. All set? All set. Yeah, I can start. Okay, yeah. I had a good luck, and you had a bad luck that the uh, presentation after mine is cancelled, which means that I'm supposed to take that time. So I always have a problem with time, and in this case, it is likely that I'm going to break two turns <laughs> instead of one. Okay, no kidding. Uh, let's start. The four of us who are in organizing committee of this conference decided that we should write a paper about uh, something we are not really competent in. Uh, that's about licenses, but uh, who is competent about licensing? But we'll come to that point. And so, a free software and open hardware license is a short guide for people in a hurry is actually the title. And uh, let's start with the aims of this paper, okay? Uh, first, we have main minimalist aims, and that's that finally, once for all and forever, resolve the difference between free software, which is not equal to freeware. Freeware and free software are not uh, equal notions. They are quite different. And second, uh, we would like to pass information and to clarify and understand for our audience copyleft. Copyleft is a really important concept, and that concept is essential to spreading free software ideas and to expanding the ideas and experiences to other areas of human culture. <clears throat> Okay, besides that, we have auxiliary aims that are advanced topics for this paper. And that's to clarify that software is different than material products, that business models of software development are sort of specific because the product is finally, is, uh, final product is specific, and to review common free software licenses that we face and experience in everyday practice. Then we're going to generalize and to analyze possible generalizations uh, regarding open hardware, about open culture, and so on. So disclaimer, first disclaimer is that the authors are not lawyers. We are not lawyers. Neither solely lawyers can solve the problem because uh, it uh, requires to address this problem sort of really specific background. You should be experienced in science, in programming, in math, and also in law. Optimal education for this task is the background of Eben Mogon, whose presentations I like <laughs> really and enjoy. And he's law professor, lawyer, legal historian, programmer, and computer user. Put that together, that's perfect person, perfect uh, uh, to address this issue. But not many, I don't believe there are any other people than Evan Moglen having such background available. So we try to focus to, to do something, to make a short, relatively short presentation and to focus to human readable layer. That human readable layer is inspired by creative commons licenses, which are going to address later on in this presentation. So, essential ideas. We would like to pass the essential ideas and their consequences without details of legal code. No legalese. No, not that, that language is not used in our presentations, neither that we completely understand legalese, uh, neither since we are not lawyers. And so, from the people who primarily use computers, but uh, is there a person nowadays who produced more software than he or she uses? Actually, all of us are primarily computer users and software users than prod users. So uh, the presentation is something strange for me. That's verbal presentation without equations, diagrams, uh, and that's not something I'm familiar with, but well, let's try. There is always first time for, for everything. So uh, we are just sharing our thoughts about the subject. Introduction number one, okay. Uh, things are getting complex. One bit doubles the combinatorial space. And bit by bit, things change significantly. You know, our combinatorial space increased tremendously. Changes are slow and gradual enough not to be noticed as great. You know, just a better computer and just a better computer and just a little bit better computer, but everything, put that together, everything is fast, the changes are fast enough that we might find us lost in digital space, lost in digital space. Industrial revolution uh, used to be, th that affected primarily non-material objects and, um, uh, <clears throat> And actually, that affected uh, as revolution of non-material objects. Oh, oops, industrial. Blah, 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 sorry, sorry, sorry. Industrial revolution. <laughs> actually, uh, the process I talked about is industrial revolution in the world of non-material objects, because industrial revolution, classical, affected material objects and affected uh, human society. And this one is, in my opinion, even bigger and even more important. Human mind is revealed from algorithmic tasks and the emergence of products without material, uh, products without material carrier emerged. Uh, well, is this really new? Uh, well, uh, science is something like that. Mathematics is something like that. 
when you find a new theorem or find something in science that is without material carrier, that's just an idea. Uh, emergence of products with zero marginal cost is also an important issue here because uh, you can produce as many as you want without significant, actually theoretically without any further expense. Emergence of products that do not wear out is also important because you see you can use one program and use it and use it and regardless how much you use it, it's still that program. It is not wearing out by, using, by, by being used. So we have significantly increased the ability of common people, we face that environment, with significantly increased ability of common people to communicate, copy, distribute and share ideas and digital content. So this is quite a new environment, and that new environment requires different business models. Uh, was there a good business model in science? Uh, working in science, in science for the whole of my career, I'm pretty sure that <laughs> there was not. Uh, one approach is to treat software in the same way as material objects, like bricks and pota or potatoes, for example. But uh, since software is entirely different, it's essentially different, you have to restrict users to to support that business model. They should not be free, users should not be free to copy the software to start with. That's the first restriction that you may face here. And enforcing this lead us to, led us to a number of paradoxes. Uh, if you introduce control for copying, well, is that control going to stop there or is it going to get generalized to other methods of control, this and that? Um, to generalize controls or control over uh, software users. So one of the paradoxes is trade secret, closing the code. But if the code is closed, should you trust the program on your computer? What that program is doing? Can you inspect that? And all of your data are handled by those programs. At least uh, you cannot build upon. You have software and with closed code, you cannot improve it, you cannot uh, adjust it to your needs. To build upon cement and bricks to create houses needs constant supply of cement and bricks. And to build uh, upon a source code, you need just one copy of a source code. So that, that, that's quite a different thing, you know, to think about cement and bricks the same way as you think about software. That's fairly different. But there is actually a potential of a single donation for software development to close the market niche where that software being targeted, being paid for to get developed, um, is located. So other competitors would be hard, would hardly find anyone to buy that software because freely available, uh, freely available substitution exists. So as a result of programmers regarding being treated and regarding software being around, uh, that revolt resulted in the rise of free software, and free software respects freedom of its users. So, let's start with well-known, well, this paper is primarily oriented, focused to our students and people who are not experienced in that area, but there is well-known definition of free software by Richard Stallman, and it contains four freedoms. It defines four, freedom, defines four freedoms that actually, as a whole, define free software. Freedom one is the freedom to run the program as you wish for any purpose. So no one is going to ask you, what are you going to use this program for? Second, which is freedom number one, the freedom to study how the program works and to change it so it does computing as you wish. Access to the source code is a precondition for this. Thirdly, the freedom to redistribute copies so you can help others. So if you have a copy of your program, you're legally entitled, you can give a copy to your friend, uh, relative, cousin, whoever. And the uh, third freedom, actually that's fourth freedom, but labeled with three, the freedom to distribute copies of your modified versions to others. Access to the source code is preconditioned to this again. Uh, well, something to discuss, something to, well, <laughs> not something to discuss, something just to state. This issue of, of about free software and open source software. The, that is a topic being res actually resolved now, but it creates confusion nowadays. Essentially, that's the same thing. Basic idea uh, of uh, open source software was to improve marketing by not raising ethical issues related to proprietary software, but actually that's sort of essential. And the marketing improvement is minor advantage in comparison to losing something essential. 
Well, conspiracy theorists would interpret this as an outside attempt to divide enthusiasts and to weaken the movement. Actually, maybe it worked that way, but fortunately it is resolved now. Our standing is the same license, the same category. So whether it's open source or is it um, free software, when they use the same license, that license categorizes the software. Both groups overwhelmingly used general public license, GNU general public license, which is something we're going to talk about later on. And both groups uh, uh, nowadays are labeled with the same label, uh, FOSS, free open source software or free liber open source software. So we treat both camps as the same since they really are. Um, well, I, which this here means that I is not equal as we, I as one of the authors use free software. That's actually my st uh, standing because I'm so-called Stalinist. Okay, no, you know, it's something that should be, should really be mentioned because everything started with it. It seems that our initial conditions are different and that uh, Younger people are not familiar about the existence of GNU, not being told about such thing. But for those who are not familiar, for those who are not familiar, uh, let's state that GNU is not Unix. That's a recursive acronym, acronym, some fun to create. And actually, that was an attempt to create free software replacement for Unix, something which is essentially Unix based, because Unix turned out to have really healthy ideas behind and turned out to be a really successful operating system. So the, prog the project is announced on September 27, 1983, which is actually really the beginning of free software movement. Uh, Linux is, a, is actually GNU Linux because Linux is just a kernel of the operating system and GNU is the whole thing. Actually, GNU is uh, operating system as a whole. Essential part, uh, essential start of the free software movement is here, as I already stated, and GNU general, pay, uh, per, uh, general public license is named after GNU. That GNU is going to appear in all the licenses uh, related to free software foundation, and that uh, that word actually originates from GNU is not Lib, uh, not Unix. Uh, basic idea was to follow Unix, Unix philosophy and create a free operating system. And uh, at that time, that was really a brave idea. But unless you do not have high goals, you'll never reach them. And nowadays, that's reality. We have GNU, and it's done. Well, classification of free software licenses, let's, do some, let's switch to some legal job, to legal issues. Um, well, we can classify them as restrictive first. And restrictive licenses require derivative works to be released under the same license. They're so-called pejoratively viral licenses because they attach to software and spread the idea of free software around. They take uh, the, the license spreads with the derived works, with the modified versions of the program. And actually, that's a brilliant piece of logic. The least acceptable license in proprietary, uh, propri excuse me, proprietary world is actually, um, are actually restrictive licenses. Uh, in some, some funding sources, even public funding sources do not accept the general public license and viral licenses as uh, something that they would fund, uh, fund. Also, there are permissive free software licenses and permissive licenses say something like we as authors provide you with all four freedoms, just read the disclaimer. And the disclaimer is the most important part. Uh, authorship of the program in permissive licenses is preserved. Disclaimer is important, well justified. And they're acceptable for pri proprietary ecosystem, at least as less evil, as less uh, harmful for their business models than uh, restrictive licenses. Some packages turned out to be a source of significant profit in the proprietary world, like uh, Spice, the circuit simulator, famous Spice, uh, famous circuit simulator, and then Berkeley Software Distribution, an operating system. Okay, restrictive copyleft free software licenses are going to be covered first. That's because I like them better. Uh, the essential idea is copyleft behind that. And that's one of the goals of this paper, to explain and to clarify ideas of copyleft. The term was uh, initiated by open letter to hobbies written by Bill Gates in 1974. And uh, it actually started the copyleft as a term, started as a word play in Palo Alto, Tiny Basic. They had, they had copy, copyright notice, copyleft, all wrongs reserved. 
Present meaning is slightly different with a deeper meaning, something like all rights reversed. Uh, that's a viral technique. The license spreads and preserves rights granted to the users by the program initial author. A modified version of the program, if released, should keep the same license. Unintended use of copyright, that was unintended use of copyright, but actually copyright started as a method to control content of books. But actually it worked. And regardless of numerous attacks and pejorative labels like viral license and so on, a lot of software is now released under general public license. So first, let us cover GNU general public license. That's a strong copyleft license, and there are no exceptions. Modified versions, if released, should keep the same license. You're not required to release your modified version. But if you release it, then uh, you should use the same license. Actually, general public license went through three versions. The first one in 1989, the second one, which lasted for a really long time in 1991, and the third version started in 2007. Presently active versions are version 2 and version 3, and version 3 addressed software patents, new, new issues, new threats for software freedom, hardware restrictions, so optimization, and license compatibility is sort of addressed there or improved somehow. Uh, also, it addresses uh, digital rights or digital restrictions management. Uh, actually, restriction is a better word for that. Not that version 3 is completely and immediately accepted. Some really important software components are still under version 2, but actually version 3 spreads. Well, there is a special issue, and that's what about what to do about uh, software libraries. For that purpose, there is no lesser general public license. And that's a weak copyleft license. Uh, well, the point is how to license free software li libraries. Under strong copyleft, proprietary software cannot use free software libraries because you cannot close them. But there was a political decision. Maybe it would be better for free software to let some proprietary software to use free software libraries. So programs that use the library are not required to keep the license. but modified version of the library itself are required to keep the license. So copyleft depends on the nature of the resulting derivative work. And that's the most important part of the idea behind lesser general public license. Next, there is you no know, federal general public license, really strong copyleft license, just contrary to the lesser, yeah, okay. Uh, just, um, um, just contrary to lesser general public license, a federal is stronger, really strong copyleft license. And uh, it addresses network applications and cloud computing. If GNU general public license running the program doesn't, uh, the, the problem is that GNU general public license running the program does not trigger the copyleft mechanism. In a federal general public license, uh, derivative work offered as a network application when run on the server should provide downloading of the source code from the server, which means that it's stronger, that's additional requirement in comparison to general public license. In this manner, running the program triggers the copyleft. So you cannot offer network service and not uh, allowing download of uh, software, um, the software source code. It is important in the area or in the era of cloud computing. <clears throat> Next, there is a documentation I'm not really in love with, but actually it's good and successful. That's GNU free documentation license. Uh, free software needs free documentation. And uh, the GNU free software documentation license is a bit complicated. Uh, it has special items like cover text in various sections and so on and so on. So it is a bit complex license, but every complexity had really good historical motivation. If you go back to history, you'll find out why some uh, solutions are imported, uh, implemented in GNU free documentation license. Okay. Uh, that's in some sense similar to Creative Common, Commons by attribution share alike license, dot, though not directly compatible. It requires attribution of original authors, it requires changes to be notified, but there, is, there are burdens when printing. Original license should be printed as well, and it is a pre pretty big document. So if you reproduce one paragraph of text, then you would have several pages of uh, license that follows. Uh, regardless of these facts, fairly popular and used by Wikipedia, and there is also a GNU simpler free documentation license is a is an, as a natural result for manuals and textbooks. 
okay, there were also compatibility issues. So people from Debian complained a little bit about the debt license and some uh, documentation is uh, released under GNU, general public license and so on. But essentially there is such license and there are good reasons for its existence. Okay, another phenomenon is double licensing, which is applicable for programs licensed under copyleft licenses. If the derivative work does not comply with the original license, special licensing terms might be negotiated, which means uh, there's an example, fastest Fourier transform of the West. And that sounds like a fair deal. Uh, we provide you with free software, and if you want to close it in your application, then uh, different conditions apply. Okay, permissive free software licenses are next camp, and they provide four freedoms. Uh, they do not require copyleft. That one of the goals of this paper is uh, to uh, provide copyleft mechanism and uh, to explain copyleft mechanism and um, permissive free software licenses do not require copyleft. They have great compatibility potential. They can be included in proprietary software. Software released under permissive software licenses can be included in proprietary software. Usually, just state the software creator, just that attribution part, and contain a disclaimer, which is sort of acceptable in the proprietary world. BSD license is maybe the first and the most best known among them. That's permissive, that's actually a family of permissive software licenses. There have been several of them, four clause, three clause, zero clause, and so on and so on, that BSD licenses evolved and uh, they used to contain advertising clause, which has been removed after intervention of Free Software Foundation, which required uh, people who use, who create derivative works in their advertisement to state the original authors. It is historically important, used by Berkeley Software Distribution, something like another, another version of Unix, and uh, it is used to license many packages included in proprietary software now and also many free software packages. MIT license is not much different, whereas Berkeley there is MIT. Permissive license, very similar to BSD license, without advertising clause, really short, the sentence that transfers right and the disclaimer, common format. All rights are granted, just keep the note, disclaimer in capital letters is included, that, that, that's the license. It was about to include, I was about to include the license, but copyright, license, copyright licenses are under copyright by Bern Convention. They also are copyrighted. Should licenses have their own licenses? Yeah, well, actually they do. There is usually copyright note that what you should do, what you can do with the license. Apache license is the last one from um, um, permissive software licenses that I'm going to discuss here. That's another permissive license, which started as a Berkeley software distribution, like a BSD license, and evolved in the same way. But there is addition. Derivative works should not keep the Apache name. Then unmodified parts of the code should keep the license, should have the same license. And this is historically important because Apache HTTP server promoted the application of GNU Linux and was the first uh, killer application, crackerjack application who, that, that promoted the, the concept of free software widely. Uh, version 2.0 addresses software patent threats in the way favored by the Free Software Foundation and it's compatible with general public license version 3. And actually Apache license, I was amazed to see that is widely accepted. So, software in public domain. And that's sort of early license when it all started. All rights are transferred, including uh, authorship. There is no authorship in that case. In some jurisdictions, it is not possible to disclaim authorship, primarily in Europe, since everything copyrightable is copyrighted by Bern Convention. Uh, public domain software requires a copyright waiver, a copyright note. Usually, this copyright note contains a liability disclaimer, which is natural. And an example of uh, uh, the effect of different jurisdictions, that's an example of effects of different jurisdictions in our World Wide Web world. world. Sometimes that's good and sometimes that's bad, depends. But put it all together, I like it better to have different jurisdictions, um, especially when it comes to software patents. 
uh, it requires careful thinking before qualifying is it good or is it bad to have different jurisdictions, but actually we cannot affect that. That's just a fact that we can discuss. Okay, license compatibility is a real issue because um, could software under license, the, the, the question is, could software under license A be used with software under license B and under what license the resulting software might be released? Careful reading and precise wording matters here. Really careful uh, of legalese terms. And then license proliferation is a problem. There is there are lots of licenses and some of them are frequently used and well known and some of them are really specific unless you have a good reason please do not create your own license that creates makes even bigger mess than it is now for common licenses there are compatibility tables i control the time don't worry <laughs> there are compatibility tables like uh, for creative commons licenses there is pretty nice uh, compatibility table which relates creative commons licenses to creative commons licenses in general, permissive software licenses are compatible with copyleft licenses, not the opposite. And here we should be careful. Just read carefully uh, tiny, uh, tiny letters because uh, BSD, uh, early versions for clause, was not compatible with general public license. Careful reading and consulting are strongly advised when resolving issues of license compatibility. Well, Something we already stated, freeware is not free software. You already heard this? Yeah, sure. People tend to forget and to mishear that, but let us repeat. First, free software provides its user with four freedoms from the definition stated at the beginning. On the other hand, freeware is the software distributed free of charge. Okay, do you find any difference between these two terms? Uh, or better to ask, uh, do you find any similarity? The notions are different, don't you agree? So why people tend to treat them as synonyms so frequently, actually, I don't know. I realized that while organizing this conference, we had frequently trouble with that because people believe that freeware is free software. No, that's quite different. Look and feel is different. Rights are different. Everything is different. Well, is the money the only thing that matters? That's the question. Okay, and now let us generalize a little bit. And in transition to open hardware, let us address open instruction set architecture. Let's get closer to the bare metal. And the closest you can get from the software side is the instruction set architecture. Specification of the instructions of the computer, the description of the computer. Should it be open and free? Should open set inst uh, instruction architectures be open and free? The case is risk 5 That's really a specific thing that's going on right now started at Berkeley uh, by Kirsten Samovic. Uh, specification is open, actually, instruction set architecture is open. Some cores are open, some cores are not open. Please be aware of that. And uh, it is a work in progress and in rapid expansion. My guess is that this is the future of computing. We'll see whether I'm right or am I wrong in the years to come. However, I would advise you to keep an eye on risk five. I believe that that's a winning concept and we'll see. Maybe I'm right, maybe I'm wrong. Open hardware, first slide. Okay, uh, what hardware? At first, let us address computer hardware from the instruction set uh, architecture down to silicon. Open cores emerged and open tool chains emerged seem to be here to stay. And could you trust the hardware anymore? Uh, does malware tend to mi migrate to the hardware level to get down closer to the silicon? Unfortunately, I believe so. Under what conditions you could trust your hardware? It seems that even hardware design should be open if you want to inspect it and if you want to trust it. At least it is important to you. Okay, open hardware second part is a bit of a generalization. Let us... Uh, Focus to an example of Arduino success. Uh, Arduino uses general public license for software and Creative Commons by attribution share alike licenses for the design files. And it turned out that Arduino is an unexpected winner. At the very beginning, no one expected that they would be winners, but actually they're huge winners. Uh, what is Arduino? Software, hardware, ecosystem, community? Well, everything. But it actually started with free software. 
then expanded to hardware, then ecosystem is created and the community is created and now every, everyone uses Arduino. Another topic are single board computers. The same system, the same approach as Arduino. I mentioned some of them in my previous presentation today. Do open hardware projects take the market rapidly? I believe they do and they create new standards. Open hardware number three. So uh, it's not just limited to computers. Uh, open hardware is popular in scientific instrumentation and CERN is being one of the leading institutions in developing the concept. So copyleft is there a legal issue? How to define what is, how to define objects that are under copyleft? How to define what is something derivative work of? It is also popular in 3D printing designs and one interesting open hardware projects is Wikihouse project, where uh, house design, uh, design files are shared freely in the spirit of free software. Ideas tend to generalize and spread, and design files should be exchanged, could be exchanged easily. Actually, with that possibility, um, ideas of spreading the design files and sharing them is strongly supported. Would open experiences create new standards? I believe they would, because uh, some frequently used open solutions would uh, push standards to go that way. So we are closing to the end. Generalization, Creative Commons licenses. Uh, we have complete success of open ideas in software with some phase delay that gained success in hardware. What, what about other areas of human activity? Creative works became digital, available to redistribute, remix, and build upon easily. After the experience with software, Creative Commons adapted those ideas to other creative works, resulting in Creative Commons licenses. Uh, well, they're well organized. They are standardized, designed by a respectful legal team, and uh, they opened in comparison to copyleft, uh, in, in comparison to uh, classification of licenses to restrictive and permissive the creative commons open new dimensions they have attribution which is you know something between um, public domain and licensed then share alike which is copyleft then no derivative works that's a new dimension non-commercial a new dimension and you can combine some of these features in some meaningful cases so a share alike is copyleft as i stated uh, besides that, an important issue is that they have uh, in Creative Commons three layers of license. A lawyer readable, meaning legal code, and that's actually a legal document. Human readable, that's something that we've tried to achieve in this paper, to make human readable presentation of essential features of free software licenses. Then machine readable, which helps uh, repositories to classify the data. So. For us, it is great to have human readable. That's, in my opinion, Creative Commons licenses are something really complete, live and maintained. Really great example. So finally, conclusions. Number one, material objects and non-material objects we have to face the fact are different. Do the same business models apply for both of the types? Well, there are attempts to apply the same business models, but they lead to paradoxes. Industrial revolutions affected material objects, and digital technology, uh, technology revolutionized non-material world. In the area of so uh, software, generalization of business models appropriate for material objects led to a number of paradoxes, as I already stated several times. Uh, are proprietary business models socially efficient? Well, the time will show. I don't believe so. Maybe they're faster than free software development, but on the long run, I believe that free software development is more is, is socially more efficient. With less effort, you can get more. The future will tell us the answers. In the meantime, we covered free software licenses on a human readable level. That was the point of our uh, paper, to cover uh, free software licenses on a human readable level. So we covered the rapidly expanded area affected by the ideas of free software and open hardware and open culture. And finally, conclusions of the conclusions. Uh, please remember free software definition. Please remember that free software is not freeware. Please remember how copyleft works. And enjoy being free by using free software. Thank you. Thank you.
thank you, um, Professor Bevich. Um, we, we also can thank uh, our uh, speaker, Sovietka Kristonievich, for giving up on her talk. So you had actually double time <laughs> yeah, for your talk. And they use it. <laughs> yeah. I have a question. Um, and do you, um, how do you see uh, free software contributes to computational reproducibility? Yeah. It's a general question, not related, but actually maybe really related to licenses. Um, absolutely. I, I, absolutely. I, I believe that uh, free software and open, open access to algorithms is essential to reproducibility. And that's really important. In my opinion, that's essential. And actually, I'm not the right person to comment since for the last 12 years, I did not use any piece of uh, proprietary software. So 12 years in computation is a long time. But I believe, in my opinion, uh, free software licenses and opening the code is essential for reproducibility. OK? OK, thank you. More questions? We have one question from yep. the audience. Uh, no, Professor, uh, how we uh, apply for a license? Do we state it uh, in front of our code or uh, there is some way of certification or something to uh, apply a license okay. in our code? Go good question from our students. That, that's really great because, you know, if you're a long time in this business, then it is clear and I cannot imagine what, what are the questions that bother you. Uh, no. Uh, actually, you just stated the license, and these licenses are also licensed. I was a bit nervous regarding time uh, because mm -hmm. uh, I had to, you know, readjust the, um, the the presentation. But actually, uh, most of the licenses have some sort of disclaimer that you can freely reproduce the license and reuse the license. So just use the license, and also you can write your own license, which I strongly advise not to do because uh, you know that's a significant legal work where every word counts, where every word matters. And uh, it's better to have professionals uh, doing that. And it is much easier to understand your intention when you use software license, which is well known, like general public license, like lesser general public license, like BSD license, MIT license, or something like that. So just state the license in your code, and that's it. That's all. Yep. Okay. Thank you. And we have one question from Banja Luka. Oh. <laughs> Hello from Belgrade to Banja Luka, Alexander Pojkanovic. Can hardware be considered free if we don't control the technology to actually fabricate it? Uh, well, 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 we had a discussion about that, you know, and uh, well, uh, free. What does that mean? Uh, when it comes to hardware, we like better to use open hardware. And what does that mean? Well, that means that what is free are design files. And if you don't control the manufacturing process, then you're in problem. Uh, you asked your manufacturer to manufacture something. Did you get that? Is it possible for you to check the product that you got back? That especially became um, uh, interesting topic when it comes to malware uh, embedded in hardware. Uh, so, I believe that it would be the best if you can control all the process, especially when it comes to masks, to comes to, when it comes to lithography and so on and so on. Yeah, we are out of time, but uh, actually, let us do that step by step. And at first, let's have uh, open design files. Then, sooner or later, we'll find out that it would be really nice to have open fabrication process and to be able to inspect what's being fabricated and manufactured. But you see, we cannot do everything at uh, the same time. Let's go step by step. Okay? Voila. Thank yep. you. Sure.